Before I start this video about narcotics, I want to say that everything I say in this video is purely educational and does not encourage the consumption of illegal substances. No drugs are consumed during the show and every appearance of comedy is merely a mistake. There is no comedy in this video. The War on Drugs is a term that was popularized in 1971 after a press conference by US President and human Richard Nixon. He declared drug abuse to be public enemy number one and announced a new initiative to tackle the drug problem more effectively. The goal of this War on Drugs, as the press called it, was to reduce supply, reduce demand, and to care for those who were affected, and we'll get back to that one later. The war has been taking place ever since then, with many governments taking part in tackling drug abuse all over the world. It's a commonly understood social norm today that drugs are bad, and it's easy to see why. Drugs fuel organized crime, cause violence, are dangerous for both individual and public health, fuel network series, and bad things generally should be illegal. We shouldn't do bad things. Bad things are, are bad. And because of that, discourse around drugs have been mellow. People don't really talk about drugs because it's a bit of a stigma around it. Of course, there is some discourse currently going on. Some countries and some states are legalizing marijuana, but in general, about the drug issue, there's not a lot going on. In general, people are pretty happy with the way things are. So collectively, we've all decided that the world's better off if they were illegal and discouraged at every single turn. But they shouldn't be. Or... Narcotics, or drugs, are little chemicals that make your brain think it's really good when in fact it's not good at all. They can come in the form of natural plants, little funny pills, powders, or whatever way a chemical can be shaped into. And there are different types of them, such as stimulants, depressants, hallucinogens, and... other? Obviously, I've never taken a drug in my entire upstanding life, so I wouldn't know. To claim that drugs are dangerous is easy to say, but hard to quantify in practicality. What is a drug? How do you define drug? If you are talking about what you can see, what you can taste and touch, then drugs are merely chemicals that do funky stuff to our brains. In terms of medical drugs, it's more clearly defined. A drug is any substance or chemical that causes a change in an organism's physiology or psychology when consumed. And that's all fine and good when you're talking about specific products made specifically to be medicines administered by doctors. But it becomes a bit vague when we're talking about chemicals that everyone else can consume on their own. And that's because almost everything is a substance, and everything is made from chemicals. Literally everything in the world. The problem is that we need chemicals and substances to survive, so we ingest a lot of them every day. That's known as a risky biological reaction called eating, and ingesting these chemicals does affect our physiology and psychology. So the question is, where do we draw the line between about what affects us and what doesn't? You may think that narcotics are simply stuff that does unnatural things to our brains, but that's not really the case. Caffeine and sugar are both stimulants, but we don't really consider taking a cup of coffee in the morning with a spoonful of sugar to be taking drugs. Jesse, we need to brew coffee. Legally then, a narcotic is imprecise. Obviously there are common drugs such as jazz tobacco and Wall Street Happy Meal, but there are always synthetic drugs that are technically not the same substance, and though technically could be considered legal, and many legal systems of course don't want to have those be legal either. Banning every single designer drug specifically could be hard, 
And that means that there is no definition of drug. There is nothing that is transcendentally drug. So narcotics are whatever we want them to be. The Quran states, O oh, you who have believed, indeed, intoxicants gambling, sacrificing on stone altars to other than God, and divining arrows are but defilements from the work of Satan. So avoid it, that you may be successful. This verse is usually what is attributed to as the reason why alcohol is considered haram in Islam. However, intoxicant is weird, right? And this has led to not only alcohol being banned, but also sometimes in history coffee, and sometimes not. And that's simply depending on what people want it to mean. Because caffeine is technically a stimulant, and so you could interpret coffee to be an intoxicant if you wanted to, but most people didn't want to. So many people claim then that narcotics are simply substances that are dangerous and addictive. And those are the ones that are illegal. But most of the world is pretty okay with drinking alcohol and smoking cigarettes. Both of these things are incredibly addictive and they also pose significant public health risks. But they are legal and we don't consider them drugs. And so it's not just in the law where the term narcotic is non-specific and vague. It's in our language and in our public consciousness as well. That's why some people now might be more okay with legalizing marijuana, but might not be okay with legalizing heroin, for example. Generally, this is also the best way of kind of enforcing these types of rules if you want to crack down on illegal substances. No one can get around your definition if your definition means whatever you want it to be. Generally, the goal of a legal system is to be fair, to maintain laws and to maintain a just society. And we live in a society. And society really likes it when we act normal and productive. Society does not like it when we take substances that make us not that. The vague definition of narcotic, then, can mean that drug enforcement agencies can both crack down on traditional types of narcotics, but also everything else that basically fulfills the same dark, hedonistic purpose. So the people who really get to decide what a narcotic is and isn't are politicians. So alcohol? Well, it's been around for a long time. It would be hard to ban. So alcohol gets a free pass because it fits in with our normalized idea of what a society is. People drink, people smoke. These things are considered to be normal. And in recent decades, marijuana smoking is also sneaking its way into the public consciousness. It's becoming normalized. And so the argument for keeping it banned also goes away. But things like ecstasy, heroin, crack, not yet. Technically modern drug laws could enforce things like nicotine and alcohol, and sometimes they do. But mostly that's not the way it's enforced, simply because we choose not to. And so it's not even the law that decides what is a narcotic, it's the enforcement of the law. But that begs the question. What does it even mean for something to be illegal in the first place? To say that something is illegal is usually a huge oversimplification, especially when it comes to complicated topics such as narcotics. When it comes to discussions about drugs and drug legalization, there is a very binary choice that's presented. Either something is illegal, and people get put in prison for it, and people are not allowed to have it, or it's legal, which means that people can smoke it, or use it, or boof it, or I don't know. But obviously the truth is that there is a huge grey area in between. Something could be illegal, but not enforced. Something could be decriminalized, so there is no regulation around it. And all of these scenarios carry with them very specific things that aren't necessarily beneficial for whoever you want to make it beneficial for. 
And even within terms like legalized and regulation, there's also a huge amount of variance. In America, you can go buy alcohol in a liquor store, I think, basically whenever you want. From what I read about America, it seems like basically Mad Max. But in my country, alcohol is sold by the government. But most of these things are hypotheticals. Things that could happen for many different narcotics in the future. The reality of the situation right now is that most things are illegal. But the way that's enforced is... Weird? If I wanted to, I could, by my entire volition, eat literal garbage. With the full support of the law, I could go out and drink sewer water if I wanted to. I could... I don't know why I would, but I, I could. I have the full legal authority to do that. In fact, there's almost nothing that I'm not allowed to eat, even if it would harm me or even kill me. But drugs. And because I am only hurting myself, the crime is basically victimless. I am responsible for my own actions after all. And if I choose to harm myself, the law has basically said that, well, I should be able to. Sure, you could legalize against people harming themselves, but that rarely works out too well. And if you did, you would be punishing someone for harming themselves. Which seems counterproductive, but if I take a chemistry set, whip up some fancy chemicals and get high, I can go to prison for that. Even if no one else is involved, and there is a clear indication that no one else was ever involved, and no money has transacted, and no smuggling has taken place, no selling has taken place, no, I have not taken anyone else into that situation, I am still committing a crime. Advocates of drug prohibition would say that drugs are one of those things that make you out of control from yourself and that you cannot be responsible for your own actions, which means that it's okay for the state to intervene on your behalf to save yourself from yourself. And there's an argument that sometimes this can hold up. Some people genuinely cannot be held responsible for their own actions because of things like addictions. But you're not taking someone and helping them to avoid harm or to reduce harm. When it comes to the law, the law focuses on punishment more often than reducing harm. And honestly, doesn't it make even less sense to punish the people who are specifically not able to take care of themselves? Why are those people specifically supposed to be punished more than the people who can control it? More than people who have a choice to not do something? In many countries, it's illegal to sell narcotics to other people. And, you know, that kind of makes sense. In a lot of countries, it's also illegal to have drugs on you. Which, okay. But in my country, it's even illegal to have taken drugs. As in, if a cop stops me, and they notice that I'm high, and I don't have any drugs on me, there's... I haven't sold anything to anyone, nothing has happened, but I'm just high. I am still supposed to be punished for that. And not in a good way. And the law even knows that this is strange too. That sometimes there's a difference between how much drugs you carry and if you have an intent to distribute. If you're not carrying any drugs, then, you know, you might get up with a warning. You're high and you've done a crime, but you didn't have anything on you. You're not gonna sell to anyone, so it's probably fine. If you have a very small amount, Odds are that you're only going to use for yourself, you're not going to sell, and, you know, you're still going to get punished, but the punishment is not super severe. But if you have a lot of drugs, and you're going to sell them, that's going to be even harsher punishments. So even the law knows that it's kind of weird to punish people severely for just having drugs. And that's not where the real issue is. But that begs the question, why are drugs bad? Is it the drug taking itself that is at fault? Is it the chemical? Or is it the things associated around the chemical that is the issue? Let's think about that for a bit. Now some of you are probably screaming in the comments that there's a difference between different types of narcotics. And you're absolutely right. 
I agree with you. Good job. Mm, you got me. And that's why I feel like I should point out that there's a specific type of drug, a category of drug, that is classified as so dangerous that it's called Schedule 1. And it's not just America that have this, a lot of countries have their own equivalent of Schedule 1 narcotics. This means that the drug is considered so dangerous that it has no medical value. And that means it's really hard to do research on these types of narcotics too. So things like MDMA, heroin, and even cannabis are considered to have no medical value and you're barely allowed to even study if they do. Because the law has already decided that they won't have a use at all. It's hard to get funding for a research project that the law has already decided is fruitless. And so while heroin is classified as Schedule 1, so is cannabis. Which seems odd considering that medical marijuana is a thing that a lot of states and countries use now. And yet it's legally defined as having no medicinal value. So that seems weird. But there's also a difference in what illegal means from country to country. In both Sweden and the Netherlands, ecstasy is illegal. But in the Netherlands, you can test your ecstasy to see if the drug is actually what you think it is. In Sweden, there's no such option. And so there is this grey area where a substance can still be illegal, but there are efforts in place to reduce harm. And this is known as harm reduction, and I'll get back to that later. But the question of this grey area is often overlooked for simple solutions. People do drugs, authority does not want them to do drugs, and so government says, well, let's make people not want to take drugs, and also let's make people not make drugs. Let's declare a war on drugs! And this is what has, in practicality, led to the ban and prohibition of most narcotics around the world. But what does it mean to reduce demand? Demand reduction efforts usually rely on making people not want to do drugs. They want to make drugs as unattractive as an option as possible. Educating around drugs, the literal threat of police, the withdrawal of any social support if drugs are in any way involved, and of course many other efforts to make drugs as unattractive as possible. It is assumed that drugs are more common in areas with high poverty and among marginalized groups. And while a lot of people attribute that to poverty alone, meaning that you can make money selling drugs and that increases the supply and that makes it more around and if there's drugs around you might as well take some and and there you go people take drugs in poor areas but that's not the full answer while it is true that the drug laws are more enforced in marginalized communities every strata in society takes drugs it's even a running joke in a lot of media that wall street xx take cocaine drugs are a pretty universal experience albeit not super common because of its illegality. So if every strata in society does drugs, then what is the reason why people start doing them? The answer that a lot of anti-drug enforcement agencies claim is addiction. You do drugs, you become addicted, and then you keep doing drugs to survive. But that's not at all the case for the majority of drug users. Most drug users are either casual users or one-time users. Even for hard drugs, the most common use is casual and occasional. And I should say, addicts definitely exist. And addiction is horrific. But addiction is hard to understand. The causes behind addiction are not fully understood. There are genetic components and societal components that are not completely understood. Not everyone that takes a drug is going to become an addict. But addiction only answers the question about why people keep using drugs. It doesn't answer the question about why people take drugs in the first place. And honestly, the answer is because it's fun. I've heard. But also, it's an escape. Drugs can fill a function of self-medication. Imagine you have anxiety and therapy doesn't work. You've tried anti-anxiety pills and they don't work either. And then, 
you suffer from this. But then someone tells you that they have a pill that is going to make all your anxiety go away, even for just a couple of hours. Wouldn't you do it? And for the first time in years, all the background anxiety just goes away. And then you have a moment of clarity. Because this means that you can examine your own mind without having anxiety about it. And for the first time in maybe decades, you get to examine your own mind without the background anxiety of the universe that so many of us deal with. Or you dance and have a really good time in clubs. Either or. I wouldn't know. And sure, it's not good to do it, it's not logical to take drugs, but humans are not logical creatures. Sure, it's probably not healthy for me to down a bottle of fireball every single time one of my videos underperforms, but do I do it anyway? You bet your ass I am. There is a movement of mental health professionals trying to get MDMA more available as a therapeutic drug. MDMA is the active chemical in things like ecstasy. And the reason they want to use it in therapy is because it allows people with post-traumatic stress disorder to process their traumas without being triggered by them. And that's because MDMA removes all negative feelings from your mind. Your brain cannot feel negative emotions. And so, in the company of a therapist, you can process whatever trauma that you have. And you can do that in an environment where you know that you can actively think of triggers without becoming triggered. And doing that is incredibly helpful for a lot of people with post-traumatic stress disorder. And having that as a tool to combat things like PTSD could totally revolutionize the mental health sector. But we're not allowed to study about it because MDMA is classified as a Schedule 1 drug. Now, some people do this already, even though it's illegal. They take some MDMA, and they sit down with a friend or a therapist, and they talk, and they discuss their trauma they can process. And, not that I would know, that can be extremely helpful for a lot of people. And that is just one case scenario with one type of drug. And that is just one reason why one sort of person uses one sort of drug. And there are many different scenarios, there are many different drugs, there are many different applications. A lot of them are, honestly, because it's fun. And the thing about the drugs is that people do them because they work. People have fun with them. Otherwise, people wouldn't do them in the first place. Also, it's cheap. It is just a fact that drugs are a lot cheaper than a lot of the alternatives that are legal. In a UK government drug survey, alcohol in bars ranked dead last in value for money. And alcohol in general was beaten out by LSD, MDMA, cannabis. Alcohol, the fully legal alternative, just isn't worth it to a lot of people. Especially considering that alcohol, as we've mentioned, is incredibly dangerous. So despite several decades of government telling people that drugs are bad, drugs will kill you, and drugs aren't good anyway, it hasn't really worked. People still take drugs. For all sorts of reasons. And there's also the fact that a lot of people use narcotics for the same reason that a lot of people use alcohol. It's fun, it's sometimes a social experience, but also sometimes as a way to cope. A lot of people simply do not have the opportunity to have the sort of social escape from society that sometimes you need. And so drugs can fill that avenue. So some people take drugs to cope, and it's not good, but again. Oh, fireball, help me. So governments know that this doesn't always work. And that's why they also work with supply reduction. The history of drug enforcement actually dates back a little bit earlier than Dick Nixon. Modern drug laws really came into full modern fruition when people started to legislate against the most dangerous drug of all. Alcohol. In the olden times, alcohol was basically the narcotic of choice for basically everyone in society. If you felt bad, you drank. If you had a meal, you drank. 
If you were alive, you drank. <laughs> People drank so much in the past. A lack of regulation, economic crisis, extreme wealth inequality, all basically meant that a lot of people felt hopeless and had one way to cope with that. And I should mention, alcohol was a huge social problem. Alcohol was consumed on a truly mind-boggling level, and alcohol abuse was one of the most major public health crises in history. So between 1920 and 1933, America did this little experiment where they tried to just ban it. Alcohol caused problems, it's morally wrong to drink, and good heart Americans should not be swayed under the influence of the evil drink. Today it's remembered as a massive failure. People drank in speakeasies, organized crime basically kept the industry going anyway, smuggling was rampant, and many people attribute bootlegging to be one of the major causes of the mafia era of the same age. A lot of people still drank, but had to turn to illegal means to do it. And a lot of people were punished for being addicted to alcohol. At the same time, a lot of people also died from drinking alcohol that wasn't regulated, or from drinking alcohol from dangerous sources, such as industrial alcohol. Basically, the whole thing was a huge mess. So before we had the war on drugs, we had a war on alcohol with very similar parallels. But while many people consider prohibition to be a massive failure, that's not necessarily the truth. Alcohol consumption dropped rapidly, and alcohol-related deaths also plummeted. And sure, there is a human cost connected to prohibition, but it did work. In similar ways, prohibition on drugs also work. There's not a lot of people that do drugs. In similar ways, prohibition on drugs also work, but also comes with a human cost. Just as with alcohol prohibition, there's organized crime, smuggling, violence. There is a human cost attributed to this. And the question is, is it worth it? When it came to alcohol prohibition, people decided it wasn't. The real question when it comes to these things are what are the goals of prohibition? The war on drugs might sound like it comes from the perspective of public health. People shouldn't do drugs because a lot of people die from them. And that's probably partially true. But there is definitely another layer that comes with drug laws. We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. The human cost associated with the war on drugs is staggering. And the issue that a lot of people have to deal with if they want to defend drugs being illegal and punishable is if it's worth it or not. Similar things happen with alcohol prohibition as well. Sometimes drug enforcement agencies look less as if they care about public health and more as if they care about suppressing minorities. Fighting drug lords is one thing, but putting thousands and thousands of people in prison for decades, that's another. After alcohol prohibition, a lot of governments realized that the cost was too great. Alcohol couldn't be totally controlled and totally banned. So a lot of countries came up with their own solutions of dealing with it. People wanted to drink and it was easier and more profitable for governments to simply allow them to. This is the point where a lot of people would argue that many narcotics should be brought under the similar control. They should be controlled substances that people can still take part of, but under controlled circumstances, and that can be regulated. If powerful drugs could be brought under government control, then that could undercut criminal funding, it would make drugs safer, and perhaps the drug could be used as a medicine rather than as a narcotic, as is the case with cannabis. But there is a problem with that analogy. When people think about the war on drugs, the image that pops up into people's minds are cocaine, cannabis, 
But that's not where the dangers of drugs actually are today. One of the most dangerous drugs on the market right now is tramadol, which is regulated, legal, and under government control. It's an opiate that's supposed to be used as a pain medication, and it's supposed to be prescribed by doctors to people who definitely need it. But that's not where we're at right now. Tramadol currently is one of the most trafficked drugs in the world, and the opioid epidemic is not just in America, but is all over the world. And it is harder to crack down on the supply of these drugs specifically, because the suppliers aren't really the Jesse Pinkmans of the world. It's big. Pharma. The problem occurs when this solution is proposed in a system that cares more about profits than people. Corporations having cut corners and advertised these drugs as being safe when they're actually not. And the result now is that thousands of people are addicted to an opiate because of gross corporate mismanagement. Management that technically is legal and is under government regulation, and the drug itself is not a narcotic, technically, in the legal view anyway. And yet, opioids today account for two-thirds of all drug-related deaths. And I should mention, this isn't the fault of addicts, it's not the fault of the chemical itself, it's not the fault of it being legal, it's the fault of capitalism. But that doesn't change the fact that the drug we are talking about is under government control, is under government regulation, and still has contributed to one of the most severe global health crises the world has ever seen. And this obviously isn't supposed to happen. When things are subject to government regulations, things are supposed to be safe. Drugs are supposed to be well managed. And the idea is that all narcotics should be well managed as well. The reason why this has happened is because increased prescriptions of opioids for non-medical use has kept going. Because corporations have claimed that it's okay to do that. And this has led to the widespread misuse of both medical and non-medical opioids. Making narcotics legal under the same scope could fall to the same capitalist trappings as tramadol. And we have seen similar things happen with alcohol. After alcohol prohibition was repealed, alcohol consumption skyrocketed. Alcohol-related health issues once again became very serious. And obviously prohibition had huge problems. But today, alcohol is the third largest preventable cause of death in the US. And nicotine is number one. And that sucks, right? Because the war on drugs has cost too many lives, it adversely affects minorities, it might not even do the thing it's supposed to be doing, but the alternative might be also bad but in different ways. So is there even a solution to this? Everyone wants an easy answer, either to ban it all because it's bad, or to legalize it all because 420 blaze it, but both of these extremes are obviously bad, but for separate reasons. Is there a solution? Every drug is unique. When we talk about narcotics generally, we are lumping together so many different types of chemicals that it doesn't really make sense. Many drugs are obviously dangerous. Many are lethal. Some are highly addictive. And addiction is dangerous and awful. But at the same time, regulation to protect people from these things seem to adversely affect minorities. People who already are subjugated to a lot of problems in society. Earlier in the video I asked, why are drugs bad in the first place? Have you thought about that? And there is obviously one correct answer. The reason why drugs are bad is because people get hurt. But there are ways to focus on the hurt rather than the drug. Since 2001 in Portugal, there's been a huge focus on something called harm reduction, which I've mentioned a couple of times in this video. And it may sound self-explanatory, you try to reduce harm, but that's obviously the case of every single strategy trying to tackle the drug issue. The thing about harm reduction though, is that it assumes that people will do drugs. 
But while a lot of drug enforcement policies focus on preventing harm, harm reduction works on the assumption that harm is going to happen, no matter what we do. And so the idea is that harm reduction should reduce the amount of harm that it does cause. And judging from how drug prohibition is currently doing, harm is happening. Say that you are addicted to a drug that needs to be injected using needles. A lot of health problems related to injectable drugs come from the fact that needles are shared and sometimes are dirty, which leads to things like HIV infections and other medical issues. So one solution to this is to just give people clean needles so they don't have to chair. And then they won't get infected as much. They're still gonna get high, but they're not gonna get HIV. And that's a success. Let's say that you wanna get high, but you don't have anyone to keep track of you to make sure that you're okay. Well, there are things called safe injection sites where you can go and you can get injected someone is going to keep an eye on you to make sure that you're okay. It can be as simple as having a place to go and test your drugs. Because if you know what you're taking, that's going to make you safer. Because sometimes drugs might not be what you think it is because dealers do not care about you. Same as we know that alcohol is really bad for us, we also know that people are going to drink anyway. So we don't say, don't drink, because that didn't work. We do say, drink responsibly. And we also teach people how to consume it properly and the health effects that that will cause. And in Portugal, the results have been incredible. I'm actually kind of surprised myself going into this video. While people still do drugs in roughly the same amounts, there's been a 60% increase in people seeking help for addiction because they know that they won't be punished for it. There's been a general drop of 90% when it comes to HIV-related drug issues. And most importantly of all, there's been a significant reduction in drug-related deaths. And while that system isn't perfect, it definitely seems better than full prohibition. The choice between legal and illegal substances is a false choice. So we need to think beyond that and think about what is it the law is supposed to do. And while it's important to think about this way about drugs, it should be noted that we should think about this way too when it comes to things like nicotine, when it comes to alcohol, when it comes to everything in our society. Just because something is illegal doesn't mean that people won't do it. And just because it's legal doesn't mean it will be safe. So maybe we can't have something be totally illegal. Maybe we can't have it be totally legal either. But we can drink responsibly. And maybe we should drug responsibly too. Thank you for watching that video. I would like to thank everyone who stayed with me for this very long video, uh, but I would also like to thank all of my patrons who have made sure that I can that I can actually do this. I would like to give a special thanks to Adam Kutcher, Aini Salminen, Alex E.T. Snyder, Amalia, Amelia Fletcher, Amy Seven, Anna Akrasia, Arguri Konu, Austin K. Catherine Stenson, Christopher Steinmuller, Koda Ezel, Xbox, Emil Rutkowski, Emily Christ, Emma Not Goldman, Fox Kent, Garrett Gutierrez, Jane Lusby, Janelle Torgeson, Jessica Fletcher, Jonathan Wardle, Josh Les, Jurgen Danielsen, Kim Kitchens, LPQ Silver, Linus 2.0, Lucifer, Marcin Servan, Michelle, Miles Lambert Gillum, Molly, MSG, Nicholas Trevino, Patrick Stack, Phobos2390, QP McKay, Rose, Ryan Kolak, Safi Hack, Scary Sun, Sula Emanuel, Thoros of Mir, Tiffany A, Uncle Cheese, Vinder, and William Petrie. Thank you.